Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Well, this talks about on Poll and it says, Build Citizens Trust, EU IPC tells INEC. The European Union and the International Press Center have urged an INEC to enhance transparency and effective communication to build citizens trust ahead of the Ondo governorship election on November 16, 2024. Larry Arugudadi, IPC's executive director, emphasized the importance of clear communication to rebuild trust and advise political parties to follow electoral rules, warning against violence and vote buying. On those INEC resident electoral commissioner Oluwatoin Babalola assured INEC is prepared to conduct a free and fair election with measures in place of building, or rather including voters education and the deployment of beavers machines for accurate result transmission. Joining us to discuss this is Paul James, he is the program manager election Yaga Africa. Good morning Paul, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning. Good morning to you. Okay, so we're talking about building trust with our electoral process. And I think is the first question is, do you think there's a lack of trust, you know, with INEC? I mean, INEC is the body that ensures, you know, we have our election. But do you think between INEC and the citizens, there is a lack of trust which has affected our democratic governance in Nigeria? So, yeah, that cannot be far from the truth. Uh, if you go back from the elections of 2023 general, uh, from the 2023 general election, where I thought we had crisis of communication because in the build up to the election, hopes were raised that the commission was going to deploy technology. It was going to be open and transparent in its engagement. And if you follow the conversation around the election, so much so that you see what had happened around that process is the fact that the, uh, the commission was more reactive than proactive in its uh, communication, especially crisis communication. When technology failed to deliver on, on, uh, 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 so on the upload of the presidential election results, you expect an immediate communication from the commission. But what you got there was the commission coming to tell Nigerians that it experienced a glitch. There was no further conversation about the glitch until one day, it was one year after the election, mm -hmm. until the day the commission released its final report of the 2023 election, which was in February of 2024, before it provided further clarification about what it meant by the glitch. But then also, if you look at other elections that had happened after that, you got the November uh, 11, 2023 election that happened in Imo, Bayasa, and Kogi. One of the problems that happened in the uh, Koji election specifically was the fact that the morning of the election, we saw over 56 or thereabout polling in a way there were pre-filled election results. Mm. The commission did acknowledge there were those challenges and that it was going to do something about it. As we speak up to this moment, whether arrest has been made, whether prosecution had happened, nobody is sure of that. And then, of course, if you go to the recent election in Edo, the same challenges, while we saw an improved communication in the other challenges, especially around how it was going to deploy logistics and all of that, you are also a witness to what happened at the resource collation process. Yeah. So I think all of these are uh, the challenges for me that are confronting the electoral process and why the idea of building trust is critically important at this moment. Mm. So, I, I mean, I, I know what happened with Edo. In fact, so it, there were a lot of people that were saying and most people did not turn out, but the amount of, um, of sleeps that they saw for a voter's sleep was ridiculous. And people were wondering, how did that come to be? So do you think that maybe with the, maybe the resident um, electoral commissioner or what was INEC not doing right? Because in 2024, we would expect that all of these challenges you know, they should have been able to mitigate them. And we have that at the bare minimum at the moment. But yet, we're seeing time and time again, we're still having issues with INEC. And now people don't trust them anymore. So what are they supposed to be doing at the moment? Why are they not doing that? So in truth, in the last 10 years there about, there has been so much systemic improvement within the commission. Mm. What has remained a challenge is a human element. Right. So if we want to say, I know we cannot divorce that from the commission, but if you look at also the staff strength of the commission across the federation, they will tell you they are under like 
20,000 or thereabout, most times they rely on ad hoc staff and they mm. rely on um, uh, lecturers from the university to be able to execute an election. Mm. What we are beginning to see is the pressure from the political class, the pressure from the politically exposed persons for the commission to manipulate the process, and also from the politicians, the kind of recruitment that has been done into the commission in recent past. If you recall, in October last year, President Boa, uh, President um, Tinibu appointed 10 resident electoral commissioners. Concerns were raised about some of those appointments. One of them was even the one in Edo, and now questions are also asked about the one in Ondo, about the level of their uh, credibility, uh, their in whether people can vouch for their integrity. In fact, mm -hmm. concerns have also been raised about the ones in Adamawa, uh, sorry, in Nasarawa State and also in Kaduna State. So when questions are asked like this, I think it behoves on the, the person making the appointment to take a back seat and review whatever are those concerns or why people are raising those concerns at that point in time. I think it is very, very important. But again, like I said, to stay on the political class, if you look at what happened in Edo, I'll go back to Edo if you don't mind. Yeah. In the weekend of the election, over 20, 30 governors were in the state. To do what? Mm. Even the Senate president was in the state. So I think that presence alone, that idea that this person are already in the state. It's enough to even put pressure on the minds of where vice engaging the process. Now, it don't largely, like I said, the process went well. It was at the results collation. Some places would tell you, oh, they were counting at, at some point at the world level. They had to skip one, two, three words, and they started from what four and all of that. I'm telling you this because even last week, I was just back from Edo, mm -hmm. where I interfaced with media and CSOs, over 60% in the room. And all wow. of them cannot just be going one direction if the things was not that bad. But if they will provide that scenario that it was as bad as it is imagined, then I think it is time that we begin to go back to the drawing board and really look at the activities of the stakeholders around the election. Like I said, it may not necessarily be the commission, mm. but the persons around the commission. Now, we know these people. We can I mean, people know them. If people are raising concerns about them, they will to make a, a good example of the bad elements within the process. Mm. I mean, I like the fact that you've spoken about, you know, the hum the human part of it, and uh, that's that's what is lacking behind. But how best do you think INEC can start to collaborate with, you know, even CSOs as well? Because you just mentioned that. How can INEC start to collaborate with CSOs to ensure that they promote transparency and accountability? Because that's what people want. People want that, you know, my vote, my vote counts. My voice is heard. I want to be able to say I voted for this person and that's what happens. So in order to be able to, you know, have that level of transparency between INEC and the citizens, what do you think, how can they collaborate with CSOs? Because for instance, the IPC is talking about this as well. The EU is talking about this as well. Well, I think to the level of collaboration between the commission, I would say they are, and the, and the CSOs, I would say they are trying. Mm. The commission organizes this with a, monthly, a, a quarterly consultative meeting where it interfaces with CSOs to provide updates about its plans for coming election or whatever are its challenges. And also close to the election, you have these regular meetings that happens with CSOs. In fact, I mean, today, if you write to the commission as a CSO that are coming on at both cases, it's they always open their doors. Like I said, I mean, some of these things are in it are not things that you can just see on the surface. You might be having all of this planning, all of these processes, but whoever has planned uh, to make the mess of the process will always do that. It's just about the human element, like I will always continue to emphasize. And mm -hmm. like I said, sometimes, whilst this, uh, the, this uh, series of these persons are out there, people begin to question them. I think we need to go back and truly look at how genuine these concerns are about mm -hmm. these uh, people. If we truly want to make the best of the process, then we should have an election that people can always go back to and say, yes, yeah, at the point in time, this was one of the elections that we could consider as perfect. But what we keep getting in every election is that hopes will be raised with this election because mm -hmm. you see all the elements will check out. But you go to the next election again, the commission would disappoint. So 
I think even within the commission, with all of these things that are coming, I am sure the commission is also worried that these concerns are always coming up. Mm -hmm. But sometimes this is also beyond the way you know that some of these appointments are not done by the commission. Mm. Beyond also that point is the fact that um, if you go, to, I mean, once these appointments are done, the national headquarters cannot even query some of the people that are appointed in the state because of the level of whoever has appointed them. For instance, the National Headquarters can never recall a record or anything because that has to also go through the National Assembly and all of that. So when there are problems with uh, uh, control, especially mm -hmm. human behaviors, then I think the, that is the angle we need to begin to explore from. Maybe when we, if you look at the broader picture, maybe begin to talk about a constitutional reform that will regulate some of these excessive powers that some of these resident electoral commissioners even have in their own state, mm. or that will give some sort of control to the INF headquarters to also be able to regulate some behaviors. Recall Adamawa State last year, what happened during the coalition process, where the uh, resident electoral commissioner, that there, somebody, Ari, went broke and decided to announce his own candidate for the election. Uh -huh. You don't yeah. want to be having this sort of elements mm. around our election. So, the process is getting better, but we still have a lot to do with the human elements. So how is INEC addressing, you know, all of these concerns, especially with technical glitches? For instance, um, you know, there was a case whereby beavers were not working or, you know, things were not being uploaded on the IREV in time. All of these technical glitches, how is INEC, aside the human, you know, element that we've spoken about that now, but if we take that away, even with their own system, it's not on it's not a hundred percent so how are they addressing the concerns because these are you know genuine concerns of the citizens well i wish i have answers for you because i'm also <laughs> part of the citizen that is raising this question yeah. because like i said in every election in fact what we saw in it though while more than 95 percent of the polling units have the beavers deployed and they function optimally mm -hmm. you got places where some of the uh some of the criminally minded INEC officials, uh, ad hoc staff, will accredit people using the beavers and then will tell them at some point that they have run short of uh, ballot papers. Mm. And so, I, I mean, it's just neither here or there. Now, if, if you go back to the results on the IRF in Edo, for instance, results were transmitted on IRF, yes, more than 98%. We give them credit for that. But what is also the quality of some of those results that were submitted? When you see some of this, you see that the number of the votes scored by parties will be different but from the number of accredited voters. These are human beings that have gone through the school system, for God's sake. They also, perhaps, may have excelled in uh, arithmetic and all of that in their school. Why is it always a concern when it comes to adding numbers for the election? Mm. For me, that is the problem. And again, if we want to place this on the doorstep of INET, I think they also have the, the constitution, the electoral has given them the power to arrest and prosecute some of these electoral offenders because I see this sincerely as an electoral offense. And if people have point fingers to some of this stuff, I think the commission needs to start making examples with them. I mentioned the case of Koji, uh, for instance. You can't come to tell Nigerians that, oh, you are suspending election in 58 or uh, 56 polling units. And up to today, there hasn't been any update about what the commission has done after after the election. We expect that the people will have been identified. We expect that the people will have been, some sort of punishment will have been meted out to the people. But up to now, that has not happened. So the ones within the remit of the commission, we want to see the commission do more. We want to hold them account to that mm -hmm. and ensure that there is transparency also in how some of these prosecutions are carried out. All right. So, um, obviously, the reason why we're even talking about this was because um, the EU and IPC made, you know, certain comments about our electoral process in Nigeria. And so, I'd like to ask, what role do you think international bodies like the EU, for instance, the European Union, what role do they play in ensuring that we have credible elections without interfering with Nigeria's sovereignty? Well, I think, uh, to the much that I know, they are operating within the parameters of what they should do. They are providing support to uh, institutions and other stakeholders working within the process. Mm. For instance, what had happened in the Congo last week was a training support to the Commission on managing communication. 
In the past, we have seen that also provide support, logistics support, and even how to manage election day logistics. Mm. They provide support to CSOs and all of that in Nigerian-based CSOs to also be able to manage the election. But I agree with you, you can also rule out the fact that because they put out resources, they shouldn't have a say in some of this. Mm -hmm. I think I also will agree that sometimes they have to respect the uh, the international protocols of this communication. I know in the past, what some of them do is to engage with the federal government first, engage with the election management body before they speak to the public and within the remits of also what our law had allowed them to do. So I, 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 if that is respected and they continue to do that for me, that is so good and that is so fine. But I know mm -hmm. the part that we also don't, don't, don't drum so much is the fact that they provide mm -hmm. this support to the institution, especially the election management body. The resources for managing election are so enormous that mm. I don't think uh, sometimes that our budget can carry them alone. Oh, wow. And that is why our institutions also reach out to these bodies to help. Sometimes they don't even come until they are invited. Let us get it very clear. Mm. Most times when they come, they will tell you we came on the invitation of the election management body. And that is what how it is done all over. The commission gives them accreditation or the mm. commission invites them to come and provide support. So when they begin to overstep those bounds, I agree that they should call back to order and ensure that they respect whatever is a treaty between them and our country. All right. So, I, I mean, you work with the Yaga Africa and you guys are always in on, you know, where the election is happening, what's going on, and you give reports. So what do you do exactly, I mean, for people who are watching now, and how can Nigerians also tap into that? How can we support, um, you know, CSOs like Yaga Africa? I think what we do is what every Nigerian do. We watch the process and mm -hmm. then for what we stand for is to promote credible and transparent electoral process but also building the movement of citizens that are interested in promoting credible elections so most times while we operate from abuja we have our 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 people all across the federation and even in some african countries so we go down and recruit volunteers from some of these states to help keep an eye on the process and they provide periodic reports to us in Abuja. For instance, last week, October 9, there was an election for local government in Plateau State. We were just from here, and we activated the structure in JOS, and they went out to observe. As we speak currently, we also are already observing the uh, pre-election process in Ondo State, where we have people in all of the 18 local governments and also at the state capital that are observing and reporting on the process. So, of course, if citizens want to engage, we are more than open to that. They can always reach out to us at Yaga on social media. I'll write to the office info at Yaga and tell us the level of collaboration they want, and we are always open to that. Just last week, again, towards the last week, we have some people from, uh, some young students from Niger State that came to the office in Abuja just to understand what Yaga is doing, but also to also have some knowledge about uh, uh, Nigeria electoral process and the democratic culture we practice in Nigeria. So we're always open to this sort of collaboration and we hope that people can tap into the, the resources that we have available. Mm. Okay, finally, um, I know Nigerians have a lot of expectations when it comes to our electoral process. And it's just quite unfortunate that we're not really seeing that as much. And most times, there's always a, a phrase that is being said after each election. That phrase is, go to court. So it seems like we're leaving what is supposed to be done with our electoral process. We're pushing, we're pushing the responsibility to the judiciary, to the justice system, instead of making sure that we have a free and fair election in Nigeria. So if you were to advise INEC on what to do, what would be some recommendations at the moment that you think will make the process even better? I think if there is one group that had used that phrase more is mm -hmm. the election commission. I just saw unfortunately mm -hmm. that this is happening at this point in time. And uh, the point will remain that if truly the process is open and transparent and acceptable to everyone, they will have less issue of people going to court. Right. But not, not leaving that to the election day process itself. You also have this issue around the uh, party primaries and how they always are contentious. They end up in the courts 
So I think, I think getting to the political parties, if the processes are open and acceptable by everyone, you have this less issue of people going to court. For the commission, for instance, we only have to encourage that. Now we have our six, section 65 in the electorate that have asked the commission now to review elections that are conducted under questionable circumstances. The commission has until seven days to go back and review election. But most times, I know elections get so difficult and it gets so overwhelming that you see that the commission is always just in the rush to finish this process and move to the next. I think we need to always have that moment of deep reflection to look through the process and see what works, what did not work, and how do we make it better before we jump on the next election. So I think to the, uh, to the commission, they truly need to start instrumentalizing Section 65 of the letter to review election that are conducted under questionable circumstances. I think that way, if people accept however the commission had managed the conclusion of the process, then you see less uh, concerns about people going to court. All right. Well, we hope that people will stop going to court and we just have a better electoral process in Nigeria. And we're hoping for free and fair elections where INEC would do their job. The human elements also um, would be better. The systems will work better. And hopefully people's votes will count and their voices will be heard. And we're going to be, you know, voting in good leaders, transformational leaders, because I'm sure we all want the same thing in Nigeria. We just want a Nigeria that is growing, flourishing for everyone. And hopefully, um, with our electoral process, it will start to reflect that as well. Paul, we want to say thank you so much for coming. It was a pleasure discussing this with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. All the best. All right. Have a nice day. We're speaking with Paul James. He's a program manager, election Yaga Africa. And we've just been talking ahead of the Ondo poll, where the EU... And IPC have said it is important for INEC to build trust with the citizens when it comes to our electoral process. We'll go on a short break now. When we return, we'll be talking about varsity entry age. Please stay with us.